Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. It says, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. That's another word for tax collectors. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press. That's another word for crowd. He couldn't see him because of the crowd. Because he was little of stature, and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he, being Jesus, looked up and saw him, Zacchaeus, and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, move fast, in other words, and come down, for today I must abide at your house. And he made haste, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. And when they saw it, we're talking about the crowd now, they all murmured, saying, that he was going to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to his, this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. This morning I want to preach to you a message that the Lord put on my heart and I titled it, When His Goodness is Seen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that your spirit, Lord God, would reside in this place and that you would use me simply as a vessel, Lord God, for that is what you've called me to do, to use my mouth, Lord, to speak forth your truth. And I pray that your truth would flow this morning, Lord, that it would be anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit that would reach deep down inside the hearts of your people, Lord, and that you would use it to effect change. Because your word says that your word would not return unto you void, but that instead it would accomplish that which you set it forth to do. It's your word word, oh Lord God, and we pray that your word would preach this morning, Lord, and we pray that you would ha allow us to see your goodness, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord, that you'd allow us to see your goodness and that it would change our lives. Yes. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. When I read the story of Zacchaeus, I imagine his life. You know, I, I, I've tried to just slow down a little bit and try to like, I, I guess you would say, read, be, read between the lines. I see a man that's probably not really a whole lot different than men and women today. What I mean by that is that I imagine him to be a very busy and a distracted man. The story explains that he was a tax collector, but not just any old kind of tax collector. He was the chief collector of a city called Jericho, which was in the province of Judea. If I was going to draw you a map, I would show you that Judea or Judah was the lower part of where Israel was, lower down near the Dead Sea. This more modern and rebuilt version of Jericho was a large trading hub in the province of Judea. Tax collectors during this time, I'm just giving you a little background on Zacchaeus so that maybe you'll be able to see along with me of maybe what this man's look, life looked like. Because I would think that if we can take a, get a snapshot, we'll realize that maybe sometimes his life doesn't look all that different than ours does. And tax collectors during this time in part of the Roman Empire would actually build, bid on contracts to be able to collect the taxes for the Roman Empire. The result was that if they won the bid, they were promising to Caesar to collect a certain amount of money. This became a very corrupt system that allowed Jewish tax collectors to extort their own people. Now you gotta understand, I'm not trying to get too deep into history or geography, but if I was gonna draw a map, Italy would be way over here, Rome, in kind of like the southern part of Italy. Asia Minor would stretch across this way. Then you'd get into the land of Palestine, which is where Israel was. And, and down here would be Judea. And what I want you to know is all this belonged to the Roman Empire. Caesar's palace was way over there in Italy. But in this particular area where we're talking about, so Rome owned all this. It owned the Grecian people. It owned the people in Corinth. It owned people of various cultures. But right now, it was, the, it was lordship over also this nation known as Israel, which are the people of God. And the people of God find themselves in a situation where they're enslaved under the Roman Empire. And these particular tax collectors were in this area Jewish by nature. 
So they were Jewish by blood. They were Jewish, Jewish by culture. They were the people of God. But yet at the same time, what they were doing is they were going to work for Caesar. They were going to work for Rome. And they were, had been contracted to say that they were going to give a certain amount of taxes to Caesar. He would have had a tremendous amount of pressure. He would have had multiple tax collectors under him because he was a chief of tax collectors. This was a very corrupt system. These men would extort their own people and they would take money, extra money, which was going into their pocket. And they had to make sure once again that they had the money that was owed to Caesar. Now, if there was a problem that came up, they would have to answer directly to the, who was the governor of that province. And that particular area where they were just happened to be Pontius Pilate, who's the one that, that caused Jesus to be crucified on the cross. History tells us that Pontius Pilate was a very, very radical, very mean. He was, he was a tyrant and he would lord over people. So I can tell you that there was great fear that was stricken over the people of that area and also in the heart of these tax collectors as they knew that they had a job and they would have to answer to both Pontius Pilate but ultimately also to Caesar. If Pontius Pilate doesn't get Caesar's money, Caesar's angry with Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate's not looking to lose his job, Pontius Pilate demands to get what, he, what Zacchaeus owes him. Zacchaeus demands to get what the other tax collectors owe them. And those tax collectors are extorting the people of God. And it's just a big old mess. So his position as tax collector means that he was this man that won this bid. He would have had a tremendous amount of pressure simply because any shortage would come back on him. With all this said, I see a great amount of stress in his life. I see him living under a massive burden and never feeling like his work was complete. There was no rest in his life. There was no rest in his soul. Everything was hurried and nothing ever felt like it was really finished or done. Now, I don't know if you can relate to that or not. Maybe you're not a tax collector. Maybe you're not even a business owner. Maybe you're not a person that feels like you're hurried and stressed at work. But I can guarantee you one thing. If Jesus, the darling of heaven, is not the Lord over your heart, he's not the king sitting on the throne of your heart, you feel a lot of what Zacchaeus was feeling in this burdensome situation that he found himself in. He was a high-level official in the corrupt Roman tax system. He had become wealthy through the extortion of his own countrymen. He would have been rejected by his own people and his companions. If any would have been, if there, if he would have had any companions, they really would have been people that were like-minded with him. So I want you to get a picture that not only is he burdened, but he's also lonely. He's not accepted by the majority of society. He's an outcast by those people that typically he walks around. Some people in our society, while we might not be tax collectors, while we sometimes think that money would be the answer that we're looking for, his money actually caused him to be ostracized. For us, many times it's not money. It's not our job that causes us to be ostracized, but the choices that we've made in our life. Amen. Amen. The choices that we've made in our life will cause community, the people around us, to look differently towards us. You know, the big thing is, yeah, you know, the big thing now is, is a lot of times people are so self-righteous in their mindset. I mean, listen, let's just pretend for a second that we're all living for Jesus the way that we're supposed to. Guess what? Community is going to ostracize you for that. Let's just say that that's our problem this morning. We're Jesus freaks, man. We're out there. We're telling people about the Lord. We're going through by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're opening up our mouth when we're supposed to. Guess what? Religion ain't going to like you. And the world isn't going to like you. They're going to look at you as though you're weird. But let's just say that's our problem. You're still going to be ostracized by society. Amen. But then if that's not what your problem is, whatever it is that the choices that you've made that make yourself look less than in the world's eyes, whenever you did certain things or made yourself look less than in the church's eyes, you're being ostracized for that. Many times we get so busy like Zacchaeus maybe or we get so busy in life yeah. that we don't really see the broken anymore. Mm -hmm. That we're just going from one step to the other and we got blinders on. And if it's not affecting me personally, I don't want to have anything right. to do with it. I don't right. want to be like that. Amen. I want to be able to be, to be aware of the fact that people are in pain. And, and, and I don't want it to be such a situation that, that I'm so busy that I can't stop and help people. 
And sadly, so many in the church yes. have been enculturated yes. by the world. We've allowed the world into yes. the church and has changed our mindset. And we don't really understand the heartbeat of God many times. And we don't understand the ways of God. And he wants us to understand his ways. And yeah. Jesus is coming for people that are broken. Yeah. He's coming for people like the Samaritan woman. He's coming for people like Zacchaeus who are lonely and busy and distracted by life and finding themselves empty. And he's, he wants them all to hear the good news of the gospel. And he wants us all to respond because he wants to heal us. Amen. And one day we're going to take our last breath here and we're going to take our first breath there. And all the confusion is going to be moved out of the way. And we're going to realize that God was real and that he really did have a plan. And it was a plan of love and he sent Jesus. And all mouths are going to be stopped and every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. It's going to happen. And I don't want to be on this side of the bowing. I want to be willing to bow my knee today. Will we be willing to bow our knee, church? Will we be willing to humble ourselves today? Yes, yes. To, to give our lives over to the Lord, to trust Him yes, in our lives. He would have been rejected by His own people and His companions. And if He would have had any, they would have just been as corrupt as Him. He would have been hanging out with the same kind of people who had no consciousness of God, who had no desire to serve God. And let me tell you something. When you, you know, the old preacher said one time, when you hang around with dogs, you will get fleas. <laughs> I mean, you can try to go out there and you can try to, to revolutionize the world. But, and I know that Jesus ate at meat with sinners. But Jesus, listen to me, Jesus at the same time wasn't doing what they did. And if you can't live your life in such a way where you're affecting the sinner and instead the sinner's affecting you, you need to get out and run the other way. Yes. You know what's interesting to me? He was so corrupt in his life at this point, but yet his name was Zacchaeus, which means pure or innocent one. If we can only see ourselves the way God sees us. Amen. If we can only see what God sees in the middle of all the pain, in the middle of all the heartache and all the circumstance and all the situation. If we can only see that God sees something on the inside of us that's so beautiful that if we would just allow it to be awakened, it'd be so different than what we've ever known. When you add the burden of guilt on top of a nonstop stressful life, the result will always be great discontentment and frustration. And while these emotions appear on the surface to be recipes for disaster. Hear me, church. I'm telling you something that I've lived before. I'm not just talking to you about something I read. I'm telling you something that I've lived before and that I've experienced. Sometimes the most painful times in our life, they look like a recipe for disaster. It looks like all is about to fall apart. And I'm here to tell you that what looks to be a recipe for disaster, these same emotions will drive people towards looking for help from God. Sometimes where you think you're in the worst place in your life, you're actually in the best possible Hallelujah. place that you could ever be. Because the scripture repeatedly talks about the fact that in weakness, his strength is made perfect. Many times the reason that we're not touched by God is because there's still so much of us that's in the way that we're not willing to completely release ourselves over to the Lord. You know, we were in the room praying this morning, and I don't even know why it came up, but Robert made a comment about how many times he'll look backwards on his life. And, you know, it just blessed me because this is, really has to do with what I want to communicate with this message. I don't know if this is going to come out. But when we can reflect upon where we were, where God has brought us, and we can be revealed to the goodness of God, and that out of an overflow of joy out of our hearts, we begin to worship and we begin to appreciate God for what he's done. And Robert said he can remember back to the the day that when he was first getting out of prison, he was so concerned about how people were going to think about him for carrying a Bible. Let me tell you something, boy. The devil is a master. The devil is a master about getting in your head. You remember that stupid story I told you about that bumper sticker on my car? But I'm just telling you, like the devil is a master at causing so much concern and frustration in our head over silly little things. And, but, but they're big in our minds at the time. What are people going to think about me? What will people, what will all my old friends think? And that, I don't know too many people that are as powerful in the kingdom of God as Robert I'm talking about. And I'm not saying that just to build up a man. I'm talking about somebody that just lives his day every day for, for Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. And brings Jesus where he goes. Is he perfect? No. If you know him real close, you, you probably 
probably have seen some faults in his life. But you're not going to tell me he's not a man that doesn't love Jesus, doesn't want to live for the Lord, and doesn't want to let other people know about the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How far has he come from that day? When he was worried about what people were going to think about him. And don't think he's the only one. How many times did I think that way? Right, right. Oh, I don't want anybody to see me reading the Bible or to be with the Bible. And I can remember back in the day, like after that happened, man, how I would go into a restaurant on purpose with my Bible. I don't know if it was all right. Maybe some of it was. And I'd open it up because I just loved the way it caused so much confusion in the restaurant. Just the fact that I opened up this book and put it on the table. And now all of a sudden the whole atmosphere changed. Everybody was looking. The waitress didn't know what to do. You know, sometimes they were very grateful. But I mean, just, I'm just talking about it caused chaos. Yeah. And I can remember back to where before I was so timid about the things of God because, oh, they're not going to think I look cool, you know, self-guessing myself. Right, right. Right? It's one thing to self-guess yourself over pajama pants. If you weren't here this morning, you don't get the joke. That's on you. But it's another thing to second-guess yourself over the Word of God. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, here's Zacchaeus is. He's living a distracted life. He's living a busy life. His emotions are getting the best of him. And it appears to be maybe a recipe for disaster. But in reality, God was planning to get him to a specific spot at a specific time so that he could have an encounter with this man named Zacchaeus. Oh, innocent one. Oh, pure one. I've come to have an encounter with you today. Hallelujah. The way this message started was that I've been thinking, like I said about the goodness of God, I've been thinking about how God's goodness will lead a man to repentance. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4 real quick. Basically, in this passage, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to the church of Rome. And he's talking to people that really look at themselves in a way that they ought not. You know, the Bible repeatedly talks about you, you ought not think more highly of yourself than what you are. You're supposed to, we're supposed to be humble, hum, humility, you know, have a spirit of humility, lower ourselves, not exalt our own self. And he says, do you despise the riches of his goodness and the forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Amen. You know, most people ignore how merciful and good God is. Most Christians, including myself at times, take for granted how often God shows patience towards yeah, us right. when we're disobedient to him. Yeah. His goodness, it means gentleness. His forbearance, it means tolerance. How many times has God tolerated Matt yeah. in the way that Matt has responded to situations that he didn't want Matt to respond that way? His long sufferings, his patience and willingness to wait another day. How patient has he been with us as we've walked in disobedience towards the will of God? I'm not talking to you this morning. I'm talking to the preacher. How patient and kind and gentle and long-suffering and forbearing is he with each and every one of us in this room? That he would have mercy and that he'd wait a little bit longer. I can't prove it based on the words of the text, but based on what we are told and Zacchaeus' reaction, it seems as though the goodness of God overwhelmed him and overcome with joy, he voluntarily <clears throat> repented for his past way of living. Thank you. All this interaction caused an uproar from the crowd because all this huge crowd of people had gathered the streets in order to see Jesus. And of all these people, Jesus picks this man to go spend time with. You know, if you could get a picture of this, maybe this is a bad illustration, but it's really not like a Mardi Gras parade. I know you don't go to Mardi Gras now, but I'm just saying, like, whenever you did, you, would, you, you know what I'm talking about. How the streets would be lined up. Like, a parade's coming. Everybody knows the place where the parade's going to show up. So they set up in advance so that they can be there whenever the parade passes by. You see what I'm saying? The people of this city knew Jesus was coming. There was a press. There was a crowd. The crowd was huge. Zacchaeus understood somehow, some way that they knew the destination of where Jesus was going. So he specifically positioned himself in a place where he could have an encounter with the Lord, where he could see Jesus Passing by. <coughs> he prepared himself to be in a position where he could see Jesus passing by. And all this crowd, just like Zacchaeus, wanted to see Jesus. Who knows what the purpose of their heart was? 
I mean, the people just want to see, man, maybe he'll turn some 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 stones into bread. Maybe he'll he'll multiply some fish and some bread. Maybe he'll cause something to fall out of the sky. Maybe he'll whip us up a miracle real quick and we'll get what it is that we've been wanting from God because we've been miserable. We don't really know what the intent of their heart was in the crowd, but we do know one thing, that there was one person that was called out and it was the one that nobody expected to be called out. Amen. And Zacchaeus was so appreciative that it transformed his life. Thank you, Jesus. The crowd would have had a problem with this. You know, Jesus does things on purpose. <laughs> I'm so glad that Jesus chose to change somebody that was messed up like me. I'm, look, I hope that in the end, whoever that person was that was like, you just ain't nothing but an addict. I hope one day that his heart is changed. Really changed. I don't care if he goes to church. I want his heart to be changed. But, but I'm so grateful that when Jesus looked on me, that's not what he saw. And that what he said was, no, I can do something with this. As messed up as it is, as, as jacked up as what it looks, as look, it looks, seems like there's no hope. It's a recipe for disaster. But I can do something with this. It doesn't matter what the crowd thinks around. They might think that it's hopeless, but I'm here to tell you it's not hopeless. Because when I breathe on it, I'll change it and I'll put life in the midst of it. Hallelujah. And I guarantee you that the world around you is going to question it. Yeah. They're always going to have something to say. And not only just the world, people in the church. Everybody got something to say. Yes. Negativity. Yes. Pessimism. Never never nothing good. Yes. Always poor mouth and something. Lord, help me not to poor mouth. Yes. Lord, help me to see you for who you are and to be grateful for what you've done and what you can do and to believe you moving forward that you're not done, that you're just getting started because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. Yes. The crowd would have had a problem with this because it would have been well known that the tax collector would not have been a close follower even of their religious practices. See, I'm talking about religion right now. Because yeah. you know the church too. Boy, they're going to judge something. And Lord knows I've been judgmental, but some things need to be judged. We'll get into that in another message sometime. <laughs> These tax collectors were shrewd businessmen and engaged in immoral tactics to gain wealth. A Pharisee, a religious person, would have never eaten at, probably would have never eaten in a tax collector's house because it would have been un, understood that they likely would not have tithed their food portions. Listen, Jesus told those, those, those Pharisees, you tithe cumin and mint. You know what that means? It's like if you just went to the store, you know what cumin is, it's a seasoning. You ever made some kind of Hispanic dish? I like, I like cumin, okay, I really like chipotle powder, but anyway, it's like if you went and you bought you a, a a bowl of chipotle powder or cumin or or you bought you some mint leaves and in order to tithe it if the weight of it let's just pretend was 100 grams guess what you owe 10 grams to the lord that's how diligent some of these people were with their religious practices you know, but Jesus would turn around and tell them, you, you, you tithe your cumin and your mint, you strain out a gnat, but then you eat a whole camel. Because you're unclean. You, 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 you wash the outside of the cup, but the inside's full of filth. You're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. It looked good on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of corruption and, and wickedness. Isaiah said, these people draw near me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I don't want to be an external lie in religion. I want to be, have, allow the Lord to do something on the inside of me. I want to be like Zacchaeus and let God show up and touch me. The religious folk of Pharisee would have never went to the house of Zacchaeus. But here Jesus is saying, I'm going to your house today. And the crowd had a problem with it. And I'm here to tell you that if you ever do let Jesus change your life, there's going to be people in your family, people on the outside that are going to have a problem with it. But hallelujah, if you'll give him your life and if you'll allow him to have his, your, his way with you, he will change you and he will bring a joy in, in your life. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. And am I saying that you're never going to have a problem? No, I'm not. That would be ridiculous this earth is fallen sin abounds temptation abounds there was a tree right in the middle of the garden 
Not on the corner, but in the middle. And every time you turn a corner, there's going to be the enemy trying to get you to go the wrong way. But God, hallelujah to the God of glory. You got more grace flowing through what Jesus did at the cross and more powerful than any temptation that the enemy might bring. So the people had a problem with it, yet Jesus, he breaks through all that religious custom and hardness to let Zacchaeus know that he wanted to be with him, to eat with him. You could say that Jesus desired to have fellowship and communion with Zacchaeus. God wanted to have a relationship with Zacchaeus in spite of his past, in spite of all the wrong he may have done. I saw three things in this passage of scripture that we might be able to learn from this chief tax collector named Zacchaeus. The first one was that he was seeking Jesus. Look at back at verse one of Luke chapter 19. It says, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the tax collectors and he was rich and he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature the job he had wasn't enough to satisfy him the wealth he had gained wasn't enough to make him complete there was an empty spot on the inside of his heart and this emptiness resulted in him looking for Jesus he needed some answers he and whatever it is that might not be your situation but whatever it is in your life that may have left you empty and now it's come, hopefully it'll put you on a path to actually seeking after the help of the Lord that's what the word sought means I love this to seek or to crave something you got to have it. Yeah. Have you ever craved something you weren't supposed to have? Yeah. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if the Lord flipped the script and put a craving and a desire on the inside of us to seek after the very thing, the only thing that we really need on this earth, which is to get a hold of Jesus? Amen. Yes. The human soul, when afflicted and left feeling empty, will begin to desire or crave an answer to the problem. Yes, Lord. Yeah. You know, it's so sad that there's so many other options out there. <laughs> but I'm telling you, man, this devil's slick. Yeah. He comes up with all kinds of options. Yes. And you got everything that you need to fix you other than Jesus. Right. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I'm not trying to pick on nobody this morning. If I hit something, maybe it's because maybe I know you or don't know you or whatever. But I'm just saying, every time you turn a corner, there's going to be something else other than Jesus that you can grab a hold of if that's what you choose to do. Drugs, alcohol, relationships, the gym, fitness, running, pull-ups, exercise, nutrition, uh, you know, yoga, uh, you know, whatever, jujitsu, martial arts, you know, punching a punching bag, something, somewhere other than Jesus. What I really need to do is get hungry to grab a hold of the Lord. Amen. Oh, man, you're just a little too radical. That's what my dad said, too, one time. I believe you can get a little too crazy about this Jesus stuff. Well, yeah, Dad, but, I mean, I loved it, too, when my sister told him that. I know I've told you the story before, but you can't get no better than that. When I was playing military football military school as a freshman, we were a small school. We weren't any good, but I was starting. That's pretty bad when a freshman's starting on the varsity team. <laughs> And I kind of like was able to like position myself and I shot the gap and hit the quarterback, made him fumble, you know, and then we got the ball back. And my dad got so excited. I wasn't there, but they said he was in the crowd because, you know, he was all about football. And he had just gotten him some false teeth. And he went to, how oh, that right, boy? Give him one, you guys. You know, whatever he was saying. And all of a sudden, his teeth flew out of his mouth. He reached out there and he snatched him and he stuck him back in his teeth, in his mouth. And, my, and, and, and he told my sister, he said, I'm going to give me a safety chain for these things. <laughs> About 15 years later, we're sitting at the table and we're talking about Jesus. Yeah. And we're getting excited about the Lord. And that I believe we get a little too excited about this Jesus stuff too. And Debbie's like, yeah, well, you sure do get excited about football. You got your teeth flying out your mouth. But whenever people want to talk about the Lord that died on the cross to set you free, you got a problem with it. You're like, yeah, yeah, I guess you got a good point there. <laughs> People want to get excited about anything but Jesus. Lord, help us break through our stubbornness. Help us to see you for who you really are. We're hurting and we're dying and we need you, Lord. Zacchaeus was seeking out their Jesus. He was craving for the answer. 
He was seeking in order to find it when the human soul is left feeling empty. The world had left him lonely and troubled and he was desperate to seek and find something that was real. That's another problem, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. I need the real Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. Psalm 25, 16 and 17. This is, I believe, the heart of Zacchaeus. This has been my heart at times. It's been, it needs to be my heart all the time. Turn thee unto me. Lord, please turn your face upon me and have mercy upon me for I'm desolate. It means to be alone. I'm afflicted. It means to be weak. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. I need you to deliver me, Lord. I need you to save me. The troubles of my heart are so big. They're bigger than me. I need you to help me, Lord. That was point number one. He was seeking Jesus. Point number two. He didn't just seek. He made sure he could see. Look at verse 3 of chapter 19 of Luke. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. And he ran before and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. Mm. I mean, he went through some effort yeah. to make sure that he could see the Lord. Sometimes we have a hard time seeing the real Jesus mm. when he passes by. That's good. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, there's a crowd of misconceptions that obscure what he really looks like. False religion, false doctrine, the attitudes and the behaviors who, of those who call themselves Christians. That's all of us in this place. We ain't picking, we ain't picking, sticking a finger in no one particular person's eye this morning. This is every last one of us. We've behaved in ways that were contrary to the will of God. And we got to always remember that our life is an open book. Somebody once said, sometimes you're the only uh, gospel that somebody will ever see. Misconceptions everywhere. So often they stand in the way and they make it difficult for us to get a clear picture of what Jesus really looks like. I don't know what all Zacchaeus saw. I don't know if the words that we read in the story are the only ones he heard. For all I know, Jesus could have preached a sermon while Zacchaeus was up in that tree. Wouldn't be unlikely. He preached sermons everywhere he went. But what we do know is this, whatever he saw, whatever he heard, it convinced his heart and made him want to get right with God. When you really see Jesus for who he really is and what he really did, it will convict you and make you want to be right with God. It won't matter anymore what others that call themselves Christians have done in the past. It won't matter what was important before. It's what the plans of you or what the plans of your life were before. When the real Jesus shows up at the right time in your life, the only thing that will matter is him. Amen. The word that is used for see in this passage in the Greek, it's spelled like this. E-I-D-O. It means to be aware, to perceive. It's not always used in a physical sense. In this situation, it's used of Zacchaeus literally physically seeing Jesus. But I got to tell you that it's also used many times in a spiritual sense. Paul prayed a prayer regarding this kind of spiritual seeing. Look at Ephesians chapter 17, uh, Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 17 and 18. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Did you know that there is a person on the inside of you It's called your spirit man? And he is the one that has to be awakened to understand the things of God. That's right. Yeah. You walk around all your life knowing all kind of good information about this natural world you live in and be dead to the things of God because the eyes of your understanding have never been enlightened. Yeah, right. Lord, we need you to enlighten the eyes. You can sit in a church for 15 to 20 years and the eyes of your understanding never been enlightened. Wow. Never have been opened up to the way the word of God really works. Right. Constantly seeking and never finding. Yeah. Looking and searching and never really getting there. What a sad thing. But an example of this exact word is used spiritually in Romans chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. <clears throat> Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word knowing in verse 9. 
knowing that Christ be his item. To be able to see spiritually or to perceive spiritually to the point where you really see it. Uh, we need a revelation from God of what this means. Yes. See, whenever Zacchaeus is up in the tree, Jesus hasn't even died yet. Just Jesus' presence and the goodness of God overwhelming Zacchaeus transformed his life and he received salvation on that day. You and I have been given access to so much more information about the work of Jesus. And what this passage of scripture is saying, that the Lord wants you and I to have Ido for us to be able to see spiritually, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we might be able to see the work of God. And what the work of God says is this, that when Jesus died on the cross and you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that the old man that you were that was born of Adam. Listen to me. I can't say this enough times. If you get tired of it, you're getting tired of the word of God. Amen. That the old man that was born like Adam, that was born bound in sin, born a slave to sin. I don't care what your proclivity is. I don't care if it's sex. I don't care if it's pornography. I don't care if it's alcohol. I don't care if it's some kind of a drug. I don't care if it's nicotine. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a bad attitude. There's something that you can't seem to shake. Amen. I'm here to tell you that's of the old man. I'm here to tell you that's of Adam. And I, the psychology is not going to agree with me. The, the, the therapist isn't going to agree with me. Oh, no, we can work it through this. No, God doesn't rehab. God recreates. God wants to cause death to the old man so that he can give resurrected life to the new man. And if it wouldn't be true, I wouldn't stand here with confidence to tell you that God can deliver you. Yes. Hallelujah. If you're willing to let him come to your house. Yes. Will you let him come home with you today? Yes. What God wants you to be able to see is that even though you were born like Adam the first time and you were born a slave to sin, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit in the mind of God puts you in Christ. When you die with him, you're buried with him, and a new creation is resurrected to newness of life. And I don't care how bad that devil thinks he is. I don't care how strong that demon that's been running on your back all this time is. He's not as strong as the Holy Ghost. He should not over come and overpower the work of the Lord if you yield to him you got to yield to him you got to yield to the Holy Spirit you got to yield to the will of God if instead you yield and you open up another door you create a whole another situation whole another circumstance all the power of God all the knowledge that you receive it ain't even going to help you anymore because instead what you did was you opened up the door and you yielded to something else and then he'll wait because he's patient and he's gentle and he's long suffering and he's forbearing. And he'll wait till you get to the place where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, where you're tired of being like Zacchaeus. And where now the desire of your heart is no longer to crave the thing that you opened the door to, but instead now is to crave freedom. And if you're going to crave freedom, you're going to have to crave Jesus. Amen. Amen. Yes. We need a revelation from the Holy Spirit to be able to see ourselves the way that God would have us to see ourselves. But in order to receive that from the Holy Spirit, we have to be willing to see what the Lord wants us to see. Amen. Amen. The world sees and communicates things altogether differently than the Lord does through his word. I don't know how many times I can say this. The world is communicating another message. Yeah. Everywhere you turn, I'm not telling you to throw the TV away. I'm not telling you to get rid of your Facebook page. I'm not telling you to turn the radio. You do what you want to do. But you need to understand that every time that we turn on the television, every time we turn on the radio, I'm not about law. I'm about grace. Yes. Listen, I can hardly find a, a, a TV show nowadays that doesn't have some kind of a homosexual relationship in it. Well, preacher, you ought not even be talking about that. Well, hold on a second. Wait, ho-ho. Oh. It's not just homosexuality that's the problem. It's just sin in general that's the problem Amen. for all of us. Amen. Sin separates us from the presence of God. Amen. You can't find any show nowadays where there's not some kind of element of homosexuality, some kind of element of fornication, some kind of element of drugs and alcohol, some kind of element of something. And it's the world's communicating and trying to convince us that all this is okay. No, it's not. 
It's, it's, it's opposite of the things of God. And that's the point I'm trying to make, that the world is communicating a different message than what the Lord is. The music that we listen to is communicating a different message than what the Lord is. So I'm not supposed to tell you that, right? Because I'm, I'm taking a chance. <laughs> I'm taking a chance. You're going to get mad at me. It's already happened. People done left the church. Because I, I talked about whatever her face is. What was her name? Huh? Yes, Cardi B. Because I talked about Cardi B. I got somebody mad because they love him from Cardi B. Yeah. But I mean, hey, it is what it is. Like if somebody's not ready to hear that and if they can go to another church and somebody isn't. Some, some preachers aren't going to say that because they know it's going to offend people. Right. Whether it's right or not. I mean, I, sometimes we got to get specific. Yeah. Amen. Cardi B don't care about your soul. Cardi B just wants you, wants you to be enslaved to the system. She wants you to be enslaved to the spirit of Antichrist. She wants you to give your money. She wants you to pay your tithe to her system. Because she got money in her pocket. And she's driving bigger cars and wearing nicer clothes and living in bigger houses. And she wants you to want what she has. She wants you to envy her lifestyle. She wants you to emulate her and to, because she's a picture of the devil. Come on, somebody. Am I saying something that sounds that crazy? That she's not a, a vessel? Does she know she's a vessel of the enemy? We won't get into that right now. I don't even know why I'm getting off on Cardi B. <laughs> because the world's communicating a message that's different than what the church is supposed to be communicating. And when the church won't stand up and say what needs to be said, we got a problem. We got preachers that, that don't want to tell the truth because they're scared they're going to get people mad. No, the Holy Spirit is in the business of convicting our That's hearts. Right. That's right. Lord, let us feel your conviction power. Yes. Lord, let us not settle yes. for what this world offers. Yes. The world sees and communicates differently, but God's saying something different in His Word. Look at Ephesians 4, 21 through 24. I'm talking about thinking different. I'm talking about having yes. a different mind. Yes. He said, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him. You know what he's talking about? He's, he's, he says previously, he said, you're not supposed to be living your life the way the Gentiles or the world lives. Yes, that's true. If you've really heard about him, I'm talking about the real Jesus. If you've really been taught by him, I'm talking about the real Jesus, as the truth is in Jesus. That you would put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. If you look at some of the newer oh. translations, it says, just put off the old man. The old person that you were before Christ. The one that you were born like Adam in. He says you need to put him off, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, you know, I used to... When I first got a revelation, I was trying to correct everybody. I'm just going to be honest with you, man. Self-righteousness rose up in me. I didn't realize it was self-righteousness. I had to fix everybody's doctrine. I had to fix everybody. I mean, you, everybody was wrong. Matt was the only one that was right. <laughs> and one of the things that I started talking about, it's partially I was right. Because many preachers are teaching that the renewed mind comes just from like you're reading your Bible. Yes. Right? Got to renew your mind by the washing of the water and the word. And if you didn't read four chapters today, you should have read five. And you need to keep on reading. And you need to keep on. Well, your focus is all wrong because you're thinking that just by you reading the word of God, you're renewing your mind. Yes, I'm not saying that you're not getting the word of God in there. But if your focal point is wrong and you're putting your hope and your faith in how much Bible you're reading. Now that becomes self-righteousness instead of learning the true righteousness of Jesus. And what the word of God, what he's saying right here is that the new mind understands that he is no longer who he used to be. And instead, he's a new man in Christ. And now the word of God can do a work and begin to renew your mind, regenerate your mind, cause you to begin to think like Jesus thinks instead of the way that the world thinks. And it's a process of time. But if you never learned who the old man, that the old man died and the new man's been resurrected and that's supposed to be the object of your faith. And through that alone, the Holy Spirit will flow into your life. You're now turning the renewing of your mind into reading multiple chapters a day. And you've turned something as beautiful as reading the word of God into a work of your flesh. That's, right. That's not the will of God. Yeah. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world. It means to fashion yourself like another. I'm just saying. Lord, help us to not fashion ourselves like another. To fashion ourselves like the world. 
but be ye transformed. The word transformed here really describes something on the inside. I know I've taught it a lot, but it's really where we get our word metamorphosis from. And I always use the same illustration because it's just a good one and there's no reason to get off of it. That inside the DNA of that little caterpillar was a butterfly. And when he went into the cocoon, which was like a tomb, when he busted back out, he was different than what he was before. He wasn't crawling around on the ground. He wasn't short like Zacchaeus anymore. He got himself a new vantage point. He got himself a new viewpoint. He was a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. And that which was on the inside of him began to show forth on the outside. I'm here to tell you, Jesus lives on the inside of you. And if you'll allow it to be awakened and you'll allow it to begin to show, it will renew your mind according to the will of God, according to the work of God. God doesn't want his people to see things the way that the world sees them. He wants his people to see life through his word. There was an obstacle standing between Zacchaeus and the word of God. Jesus is the physical manifestation of God's word. Right? John chapter 1 verse 14. The word became flesh. Zacchaeus had obstacles in the way. His short stature, the large crowd stood in the way of what he needed. But he refused to let it stop him from seeing Jesus. Zacchaeus changed his perspective. Being short, he had a certain vantage point. All his life, he saw, I know I'm using, I'm, I'm taking some liberty with this. All of his life, you ever been short? No, you might not have been. Maybe you were when you were a child. I don't know if you remember what it looked like down there, but it was every time I look, sometimes I'll tell Aaron, man, what's it like up there? <laughs> no, what's, it, what's life like up there, brother? It's a whole different vantage point to be 6'5 as opposed to 5'9, if that. Right? I mean, when you've been short all your life, you're seeing things a certain way. Zacchaeus couldn't see nothing, but he changed his vantage point. Hallelujah. He got up in a tree. And he was able to see things differently than the way he saw them before. He refused to let it stop him. He changed his perspective. Amen. He saw Jesus and his life was never the same. He did more than just seek him. He wanted to see him. Amen. Last point. Point three. He sought. He saw and he was saved. Look at verse 5, chapter 19 of Luke. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and he said unto Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house. He made haste, he came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, the murmurs in the crowd, they all murmured saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, behold, Lord, listen to this, something happened. The crowd was murmuring. They were saying he's unworthy. Why is Jesus picking him over us? And somehow at that moment, the goodness of God overwhelmed the heart of Zacchaeus and out of his heart. Nobody asked him according to the text. To, to start spitting all this stuff out of his mouth. No. Let me tell you something. Whenever you're sitting in a service, whenever you're reading the word of God, when you're worshiping the word of God, worshiping the Lord on your own, the Holy Spirit will start to whisper to your spirit man. He will begin to speak to you things that no man could ever speak to you. And whenever you will listen to that voice that's speaking on the inside of you, he will begin to tell you things that you're supposed to do. Lord, teach me your ways. Give me understanding of your path. The Lord wants to bring you down the right path. He wants wants to give you revelation of the direction that you should go immediately out of his heart began to flow the conviction of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit revealed to him the things of his life that he had done wrong he knew that he had extorted people he knew that he had taken unjustly and he had gotten it through ill-gotten gain he, listen, man, according to the law if you read the law this, this text tells us that he went above and beyond he went above and beyond. He wanted to restore more than what the law required. The Holy Spirit started showing him what he needed to do in order to make things right. Amen. The Holy Spirit will show you what you need to do in order to make things right. Amen. Amen. Jesus said this. He said, I want to abide with you. It means to live someplace. He wants to continue with you. The places where Jesus, is li Jesus lives and they have to be changed. If a man is going to be saved, Jesus is saying, I must abide in your house. True salvation requires that the Spirit of God live inside this tabernacle of flesh. But in order for God to live in here, there will have to be some internal change taking place. Yes. The crowd murmured at the thought that Jesus, a rabbi of great notoriety, would eat at a sinful tax collector's house. But more important than that is the fact 
that Zacchaeus tunes out the noise of the crowd and focuses on what his heart is saying. Naya, could you come to the keyboard? We're going to close. I'm going to get her to play a song. Zacchaeus tuned out the noise of the crowd. He allowed the Lord to speak to him. And he responded to the voice of God. Verse 8 says, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Zacchaeus was saying, Lord, I've done wrong, but I want to make it right. He went beyond the law. Zacchaeus went above and beyond what the law required. He desired to make good in response to forgiveness, not in order to receive it. See, some people want to try to work their way to be receive forgiveness. Zacchaeus felt the goodness of God and it overflowed out of him and he wanted to make things right. True repentance has a response towards right. I want to say that again. True repentance has a response towards right. 